and this is weird, but sometimes I like to watch videos of different places. I got kind of fascinated with this whole thing when I watched, I watched the very first time this last year that I got on Twitch that I was just watching random things. I was just trying to learn more about it. Now, this is not on Twitch. This is on YouTube. I am fascinated by seeing videos that will feature areas people live. It, it's such a such a thing for me to think about because it, as you can see this is just footage of somebody steady cam walking through areas in a city in Japan and if you go on YouTube there's all kinds of ASMR videos of here's this per particular you know area in Japan or in India or Spain or Italy or something almost every geographical area recorded what I find really fascinating is I wonder if it really dawns on people how much we're actually capturing in time, how, how crazy valuable this really is. And there's always this thing in the back of my head, every single time I watch any sort of dystopian future sort of movie, this really struck me. It was one of the Planet of the Apes movies. And I think it was the villain. God, who was it that played him? It was in the modern ones that have come out recently. And he had... He had a broken iPad, had, the screen was messed up, and whenever they, I think they managed to get power back on or something like that, the first thing that they came up with was his family, who was long since gone. I think it was a, maybe his wife and a couple of boys, I don't know. And they were clearly younger, and this gentleman was far older. And all I could think to myself was like, that that's exactly how that sort of thing would be, right? We would someday... And I don't know that I'm not saying this with certainty or being doom and gloom. I just find that aspect fascinating. Imagine, and, and some of this is because a little bit of this is research for a story I'm doing. But I've always been stunned by what would that be like? You know, it, uh, you know, being a survivor, being somebody who was raised up on the stories of these massive cities and technology and glowing lights and food and major metropolitan areas available at any point in time. The bad thing is this also makes me crave everything from sushi to stir fry to like, you name it. It's just insane. And, uh, but I, I think about how much we often take for granted what we do have right now. Right. And, and there's so much that I think, you know, we, when I'm looking at this, this is gorgeous, right? Watching these, this bit of footage and everything. It's, it's magical. It's glorious. It's in 4k. <laughs> And I'm a little bit jealous that this person is able to handhold his, as well as they've got to be using some sort of stabilizer. But the whole thing about it is that even with that, oh, he's using a little blower on his screen to get the water off. That's brilliant. Even with that, something that, that I, that just sticks in my head is just that. It's that these people are recording times and places. And, and this is nothing new. People have been doing that since the first cameras came about. That's why we have old footage that has miraculously managed to survive. That is what now almost a hundred and I think some of the oldest footage is easily over a hundred years old, right? I'm not crazy on that. I'm not, I, I, you know, I'm huge into cinematography and, and filming and media and things, but that's something I really should go and look at. And I, I'm going to think about that for this next video. Like, Hey, when was the very, very, what is the oldest one? In fact, we may not know what the oldest one is. Time in memoriam just kind of like, we'll, we'll forget things. I mean, it's just like all of the, like there was a photographer during the Civil War. Now this wasn't with film, um, the, you know, motion picture film or anything. This was photographs he had taken and they were on glass negatives. And for, if I remember this right, he took hundreds if not thousands of photos of the battlefields and everything, but it was considered too garish, too horrid. This war was just, violent and vile like any war would be and so he couldn't sell any of the work he had so i think either after he died or before he died most of those glass plates ended up being used for greenhouses so the sun of course washed out all the images and stuff they're lost to history now and uh i don't know it's just a weird thing thinking about that it also gets me hyped and excited that maybe someday I will be able to attend some of these places. I thought about that earlier, like some of the places I have yet to go to that I would really love to go to. And it's not like I'm a super well-traveled person, not by far. I remember when I was younger and 
when dad got sent to Aviano, Italy, and we stayed there for three, four years, roughly, that was really cool. Being able to go see Rome, being able to go see a lot of stuff there, that was just phenomenal. And then when we were flying back, we stopped in Germany for a little bit, and also Britain for a bit too, I think, if I remember right. And then what was really crazy was just thinking to myself, I'm like, you know, as I got older, I'm like, there is so much in this world I haven't seen. I missed out twice, two times, when I was taking my honors Egypt uh, Egyptology class. I don't, I, I don't even know why they called it honors. I, I really don't. It's a very weird, very weird thing. Because when I took it, you know, it was cool. I, I knew some about it, and the tests were pretty hard, and it was a lot of reading about who was, you know, who was Tutmos, who was uh, this, and all, you know, all these different pharaohs, and then, you know, the old kingdom um, stuff, or you know, upper and what was it, upper and lower kingdom, and then the era whenever Rome was involved, and all this other stuff, and and I think it was the Hyksos. I'm forgetting a lot of this, but I I used to it used to be my big jam. And I always told myself, I'd, I want to go see the pyramids, uh, not only there, but in South America, before I, you know, I, I, I'm, it's too late, which means too old, knees are bad, or something like that. Like, that's what I really want to do. And videos like this at least are a, a way to kind of enjoy that sort of stuff and remind myself, hey, here's a goal I want to go to and, and do. I guess the reason I'm bringing that up is just, it's such a... It's such a weird thing that when, when I was younger, the idea of being able to go anywhere I wanted in the world was a very cool idea. And I remember because of the movies I watched and books I would read, that was just something that I was like, man, I really want to see that stuff or I, I would like to encounter this or whatever. I think it's probably one of the reasons why like whenever I'll go hiking or I'll go somewhere, I really, really get into the whole thing of being able to get out and and find new places or see something that I just haven't been around or seen. And it's just, I mean, who doesn't, right? But what I worry about is something that is creeping into my life nowadays. I spend so much time in front of the screen, in front of other stuff like that, that I've been trying to pull back a little bit and go, okay, no, wait, what, what are we doing here? What, well, you know, what are, what am I doing with my time? What am I doing to make sure that I will someday be able to actually walk streets like that in Japan or in any other country or any other part of the United States. I've only lived in a few states here in America. In fact, I was thinking about that. You know, I, I had gone to Yellowstone. Well, God, this has been two years now. Dream freaking country. That was crazy. That was very impromptu. And I was, I was pretty dead broke, but made it work. It, it was it was nuts. It was really nuts. Um, I'm grateful that it was a family trip. That's for sure. I really am very grateful about that. It had been something that ever since I was young, you know, when you were watching Yogi Bear cartoons and they have Jellystone on there. And, you know, you, for me, it was looking at all these things and I was like, wow, that's crazy. I wanted to go. There's a multitude of different national parks I would have loved to have gone to. I didn't realize until I went back and I looked at some old Boy Scout stuff of mine that I had also gone to, I think it is the Saguaro National Park. I'm probably getting the name wrong, but it's the one down in Arizona, just outside of Tucson, I believe. And I had gone there to get some merit badges done. It just it was a really cool time. It was one of the few times that I went with my dad and it was just a really cool, overall, very cool time. I, I, I just really enjoyed it. And, but I, that formulated a lot of really great memories for me, being out in the, in, in the desert areas. And although I'm not a fan of heat, I really did love Arizona so much. Oh man. So what else, what else, what else, what else? This one will probably be pretty short because there's, there is some stuff, you know what? There's a point where when I'm doing these, I kind of edited a few things out. There was a really weird incident that happened with one of my neighbors today, but I was like, this isn't really, this isn't really the kind of video that I want to do where I'm just bitching and moaning or complaining about something, but it was a pretty serious, I'll go this far just for my own memory. It was a pretty serious situation that involved the, the younger man that lives next door. Thankfully, everything turned out okay, and nobody got 
you know, in trouble or hurt or anything, but it was still very scary. Um, and maybe later I'll divulge more into it just because, you know, I, I'm worried I'll forget about it. But this, that I will probably end up writing down in my personal journal that will never get published. And so that set me off on a weird thing today where sometimes when, when things happen in life and this, I am looking forward to my therapy session tomorrow. That is, a, that is a definitive thing I'm really looking forward to. Uh, sometimes that's what I don't understand when people are resistant about going and having therapy. Maybe they've had a bad therapist or whatever, but it gives me a chance to get some shit out and go like, Hey, this was not okay. <laughs> this was not great. Man, you know what? Another thing I was thinking about too was that I I had thought about like all the times I've been cussing in these videos and even across some of my other videos that I've done, and because I had looked into and this is this is a real thing I had you know looked into the whole monetization aspect here on YouTube and whether or not I'd be able to do any of that stuff and much to my chagrin it it seems to be you know which is fair advertisers want your your content to be fairly friendly to their content you know so i was like okay well whatever again it wasn't anything where i was really looking to monetize stuff but i've been taking a step back to look at you know what does what does the next few months look like um because you know i after so after the whole knockacom thing i decided i'm i'm probably not going to do any shows this year i'm just really going to take a seat back and I've been obsessed with this idea of seeing kind of how, from a social standpoint, what would that be like if I just took a step back? Financially, it's going to fucking suck. <laughs> but but it would have sucked also paying for shows that maybe I wasn't making any money at. So the challenge was if I take a step back and I reinvest and redouble my efforts into what I'm doing currently, what will that look like? What will that be like? How is this going to, how is this going to affect me over the course of this year? How will I be able to grow other aspects of my business? How will I, quite frankly, how will I keep things going? Now, there have been people that I've talked to that said, well, you know, go, go live on Twitch, start building up a following on there. Okay, that's fine. I, you know, sure, but that's also, well, what am I doing on there? Am I doing art? Am I doing video game playthroughs? What am I doing? Because I'm still trying to figure out that wonderful balance of what, what I'm jumping into, you know, work-wise, and then what I have to create for myself, and then also just doing things like this. It's that balance aspect again. And some days are better than others. You know, today wasn't bad, except for a couple of weird things. But thankfully, it seems like I'm on an upswing and that the the old depression thing and all that other stuff isn't as bad as it had been. So I'm okay with that. And then there's other things, too, where I think to myself, like, well, you know, if, if with, with no show right now bearing down on me, I did feel better. I do still feel better. But there's also this whole feeling of feeling slightly lost, which is a weird thing. But I know why. It's because you, you get this idea in your head, like, oh, this is going to happen, this is going to happen. No, it's not going to happen. And life, though, is filled with change. It's filled with the unexpected. And that's the unfortunate truth. Because we can we can make the best plans in the world, but, you know, that's just, that's just what's happening. And speaking on that same thing, I'm going to go ahead and end this video pretty early, just because... I actually don't have a lot to talk about today. Well, I do, and then I and then I don't. Yada yada. So I'm gonna finish with this. So a few friends of mine, I've got, I've got a lot of uh, good vibes thinking out for them right now. Um, where they can't talk about it, I can. Hallmark is again downsizing. It's not even in the fucking news. Nothing else like that. The they are taking voluntary layoffs okay and the way it works basically is if, if whenever you leave hallmark if you were a full-time person they would give you a year's salary when you left that's actually really fucking incredible and 
I, I believe it was based on not just how many years you'd work there. So like, I think you had to have worked over 10 years there or something to have gotten a full year. If you worked under that, I think you get like a few, like six months or something. I don't recall either way. You don't leave there penniless. You do have that. And I think your, I believe your health insurance may last for a few months or a year. I'm not sure exactly how that works. Either way, they have done a thing where they're wanting people to volunteer to get the fuck out. If you do that, I believe they're also giving you a 10% bonus on top of that to quietly, you know, go off to the Grey Havens. On fucking Valentine's Day, I think, that is the deadline where then they suddenly start just getting rid of people. Those people, I believe, will still get the year's severance package or whatever time they have for how long they've been there, but they lose the 10% bonus because they didn't volunteer to end their careers. <sighs> I've always thought that Hallmark was very much reaching out to a position and platform. If you go downtown and you go to the Crown Center in Kansas City, it seems like they've been selling off quite a few of the buildings. Their campus isn't as big as it used to be. And there's a lot of fluff and circumstance involved around a lot of what they're doing. Hallmark has a really weird position where they don't go public with a lot of what happens internally at all. And that's true of most companies. But even more so in this one. And I can imagine, because I've been through this, that a great many people are trying to keep their heads down and hoping that nothing shitty is going to happen. A vast majority of them are also working from home. So it makes us the, the losses a lot more abstract and harder just in general. I don't know what the end game is aside from it feels like they're positioning themselves for a cheap sell off in the end and that the halls will make as much money as possible on this. I don't know. I feel bad for anyone that's still there that is having a stress filled couple of weeks and days up until this happens. S super fucking sketchy as shit. I know I've told this story before, but when I, the last time that I worked there, before I came back on his contract when I was still full time, is a very weird, weird scenario. And for those of you that haven't seen or heard any of my old podcasts where I talk about that, I can say this frankly. I'm going to end on this because this is how, this is how the downsizing worked when I got let go and then was brought back as contract. I made more money contract, but of course they weren't paying my health insurance or 401, because it was none of that shit. We were told about two weeks in advance that there were going to be wild, you know, things happening and rumors fly like crazy. Everyone knows everything, all this other shit. And I, for the, and for what it was worth, you know, there was half truths all the way around. And I worked in an area called CMDO. Uh, so the central data management organization or something like that. And I was, I believe I was called a PA at the time. So that'd be a production assistant or something. like. I don't remember exactly. You're not considered part of creative because that was technically an area under IT. So if anyone in creative was getting let go, that didn't really affect you. And you couldn't really make a transition. Even if I had the background I did doing illustration, graphic design, whatever, it was almost impossible to move laterally anywhere in the company. They kind of wanted you with these fucking horse blinders on and that's, that's all you did. Unless jobs and areas went away and then you managed to finagle your way over into something. It had been building and building and then like out of the blue, they started letting people go. And people didn't know what was happening. It would be something where you'd be sending an email and an email would bounce back or something weird would happen. And then we'd get these inner office emails occasionally that would start saying how we started to, to just literally hemorrhage people. What's crazy is they rolled it out in these weird things. And here's, I'm gonna tell you some fucked up shit that is 100% true. None of this is hearsay. None of this is bullshit. This is personally what I went through and witnessed. And I have an, an incredible amount of email. I used to save all sorts of emails from that time I don't remember totally why it wasn't for any sort of crazy reason aside from I wanted to remember what was happening at this moment because it really struck me 
as bizarre to watch a company start to go down. And I wanted to remember these things and maybe use them for story ideas or journal about them later because it was my experience in there. And it was something where I thought, well, if I were right about this, I, I can remember these things because someday I'm going to forget. So I've got printed emails and shit backed up like crazy, all kinds of things. So, and I don't really give a fuck because I don't work there anymore. And I never will again. Uh, they ended up letting people go. And it would be just one thing after another. You'd start to see weird things happening. And then it was announced that voluntary layoffs were going to be going. So when it started to happen, at first, I think it was 200. And the numbers I have written down, and they're in emails. But I think it was 200 people. And then like a couple months later, it was another 300 people. A couple months later, was some other. They would pick different areas. And it was a strategic downsizing that was happening, happening consistently. Sometimes it would happen out in production. Sometimes, you know, like in the in the uh, warehouses. Sometimes it would happen internally in the big building downtown here in Kansas City. And it just was a weird thing. It, there, and there would be all, there were all these weird warnings, like because they had to start tightening their belts. Like in the 90s, Hallmark was printing money. After that, shit started to go really bad. I, th I you know, I think it was a lot of weird management issues and not just directly in the halls, but the people they hired specifically. And then just a lot of weird wackadoo things, their resistance to utilizing and bringing in computers, a weird sort of thing that happened with Mac. Like th there was just a lot of shit that was very weird. So, but those are all different stories. This is specifically about the downsizing that started to happen within the last 10 to 13 years. And I think they knew the writing was on the wall because, you know, greeting cards aren't what they used to be. And they probably never will be again. Even if we have a renaissance in print and media, like books and stuff come back, I don't believe greeting cards ever will. Not in time to save that company. But the level of denial I would hear, we'd go to these meetings and we'd have, I remember there was this one lady that stood up and it's always crazy to see that grandstanding bullshit that people will do to fucking suck ass cheek at these fucking meetings. She stood up and she was like, Hallmark is too big to fail. Too big. And I think we need to give a round of applause to the Halls for keeping this company going, even when people don't realize what's good for them. I mean, like crazy shit like that. And just nuts. And then I remember that our healthcare options started going worse. And they did things like this. Because we had a lot of product that was Hallmark-based stuff, like cups and paper products and napkins and things, when they had overrun, and they almost always did, instead of recycling it, they would bring it to the break rooms and it would be dispersed among the different floors. And so you'd get all this stuff. We started noticing that the paper plates and cups and everything started disappearing. They were like, no, we're not giving that shit away. And everything started moving to this place called the Double Discount Store. They called it the DD Store, and or the Double D Store. And so you could go there and buy things like that. Grant dirt ass cheap. So everything from like their $7 fucking, you know, wrapping paper was like now a dollar or things like that. It's just crazy shit. And uh, sometimes you would be lucky and you'd find some really cool stuff. I actually ended up buying a Zelda board game that was slightly damaged that had been at a gold crown store and then got sent back there. It had like a small puncture in the top of it. Nonetheless, as this is happening, the heartbreak starts happening. People start finding out, you'd hear, and you'd see things, you'd see people come back and they're either red-faced or whatever. And I'm like, oh my fucking God, it's happening. Well, it finally came around to our group. And, uh, Jesus, this is so fucking weird thinking about this. But when it came back to our group, I remember that they, we had been training. Now understand, we've been training people in India for a while and they kept saying, no, they're, they're just here to help you. You know, you're here to help kind of guide them. I couldn't believe we were buying the shit. I wasn't. The entire time I kept begging them. I was like, look, if you're gonna let me go, let me know so I can go get another fucking job. But I didn't want to lose the money I had there and finding a job at that point wasn't that great. So I just held out hope that maybe I'd make it through the end of the year or something. So what ended up happening was that finally they made an announcement, and if I remember this right, some of us got an email saying that we had a meeting in one area, and some of us had a meeting in another place, and this was beyond fucked up. The people that got pulled over into the other group were the ones told that 
myself and a couple of other people were being let go and optioned out. So what that meant was we got pulled into this room. Now, where CMDO used to be, there was a hallway, and we also got moved around a lot on the floors because fucking people love playing human checkers. I don't fucking know. It used to be this weird hallway because there was there there is a there was a ton of areas. Hallmark was a very empty building. You'd have entire sections of floors that were just like, you guys ever seen that series, The Back Rooms on YouTube? I, I recommend you look that up. I think it's this Dynamo. He's in his twenties that did this wonderful horror thing. And if you work if you work corporate America, it is going to hit you in an area where it's just like, what the fuck? That is scary. There used to be floors like that. I have photos from that time because whenever I would go from my floor to go to the Leap Lab to work on 3D things or projects on my own because there wasn't a lot of fucking work to do, I would always walk through a specific area. I think it was either floor five or four, floor six. Actually, both of them were like this. There were entire swaths of area that were just darkened. Former desks, shit left behind. It was very creepy, very weird, especially after work when most people had gone home. It just lent a weird, eerie feel to everything very odd so we get taken into this room and as god is my witness this is true we're in there and I, if i remember right it was a vp that was over our area and then our no the vp over our area and our direct manager were both given were both told to take pto days off so management was gone when this happened strategically so so it's just the worker bees being pulled back to be called. <laughs> this is what was happening. So we go back in this room and I remember distinctly sitting next to a friend of mine that I'd known for years and he was the one that helped get me onto Hallmark. He was there and then a, a bunch of older ladies that were phenomenal in their data entry skills and everything. And then a few other people that I didn't know what they did. And they basically just came out and said, we have one position that will be open at one of the offsite areas you can apply for your job and it was just like all these things that office space got so right like basically you get these people to come in you had to re-interview for your jobs and shit and it was like what the fuck so in my head i'm like I i'm out like i didn't give a fuck anymore like i was like nope I, I can see it there were still people in denial in there and i didn't give a fuck i was like i cannot wait to get back to my desk let me get some fucking boxes let me get the fuck out of here i don't care there's a bunch of shit i want to do i just got paid this last friday i'm fine i wasn't fine but i was fine and <laughs> so they they announced it and i mean you could hear a fucking pin drop in the room and the next thing I know, like, we're told, you know, you've got the rest of the day to basically get your stuff together. And then you can have the rest of the day. We're going to give you the rest of the day paid off. And then you're, you'll be paid the time that you've worked and everything. So I think I had, like, two weeks and a couple days that still had to be paid to me. And when I left there, it felt like an enormous weight had been lifted off of me. Because I knew what was happening. I was never in denial of what was happening with the company. But I ended up running across a dear friend of mine who used to sit right next to me back where our cubicles were. And she came running up and she was like, hey, did you? And I'm like, I'm I'm out. I, yeah, they, I, I'm, and she started, she was like, oh, God damn it. And she's, and she was like, I was like, don't you cry because I'm going to cry. Because <laughs> it was hard. It was hard. So she managed to make it. They gave her an ultimatum in the other one that basically they needed her to relocate. Now, this is a woman that didn't drive, had worked at the company for well over 30 years. And they were telling her that she now needed to find a way to take public transportation out to this other area way the fuck out. It was insane. And she, and she was one of the first ones to really fight for, you know, I can work remotely. I don't have to be out there. And then COVID hit and proved her completely right. So... The next thing that happened, and this is kind of a weird thing. I have a lot of this specifically written down. I'm talking like down to the half hour, hour, down to the days. But I'm giving you a general kind of Cliff Notes version. It was either within the next hour or two, they gave us access to boxes. There was a guy that came by. He was kind of sorry to see us go. And he was one of the maintenance people. And he had boxes on this big cart. People were just coming over and you could hear crying. You could hear different things. And one of the ladies I worked with, she's like, I don't even care. I just, I'm going to get myself and get out of here. It's not a big deal. 
but everything came back and reminded me and when I was helping, I was one of the staff members because I didn't have a lot of work at the time. So they gave me a project to help close down the Canada offices that were happening. And that was really weird too. Um, to kind of give you an idea, because I, I already I had already witnessed what happened to this one woman. And when I talked to her, I guess I was helping transfer files from Canada over to us. And because they have different size formats, measurements, all this metric and all this other stuff. Um, but not, not just that, it was preferred sizes. And I guess we were going to carry on with it. I don't know what happened with that beyond, but I used to talk to her all the time. And she's telling me exactly what was going on and like how when people kept leaving and everything. And we would meet every Thursday. I think it was about eight or nine weeks of it. So I got really used to talking to this, to this lady. It was really wonderful. We just spoke about a lot of things. And I told her I'd always wanted to learn French. And she was like, oh, you mean like Canadian French or real French? I was like, I think real French. She's like, okay, yeah. She's like, that's the prettier one. And um, I always told her I wanted to, you know, go up there and visit, you know, that area. And I, I, I'd heard a lot about the woodland areas of that. It just became, we got a repertoire going back and forth. And then somewhere around the eighth or ninth week, we were going through the list. Because we'd always start talking, see what's going on. And then we'd go through our work and kind of joke and talk throughout it. And I always handled it toward the end of my day. And I remember that I, I, you know, the meetings would normally be like, if the phone calls would be anywhere between maybe 15 minutes to an hour, depending on how many SKUs we had to get through to transfer over. And like, hey, I'm sending this art over, or this is what's happening here. Or, We've gotten this together, or this has been approved or whatever. And then I'd be inheriting the master design files to be uploaded into the system. And so when that happened, uh, there was one day where we got to talking and then, you know, I was like, you know, okay, well, I guess I'll, I'll catch you next week. And she was like, oh, no, honey. She's like, this is my last day. I've actually got the keys set out. And as we were talking, I was packing up my desk. And, like, it got fucking ice cold in here. And that's probably the first time that I really felt that fucking gut punch. So... I got a little emotional and she was like, no, no. She was like, I'm, I'm going to be okay. For too long, I put off everything in life that I wanted to do, which included teaching piano and playing piano. I already have a bunch of people that have told me that their kids want to learn and they want to learn. I want, and I've always wanted to learn piano. So this was a weird coincidence thing, but it wasn't like I could have learned from somebody in Can in Canada, in Canada, in Canada, up there in Canada. I don't even know what the fuck that accent is. And so she said, you know, this is something I'd always wanted to do. I really want to spend time working on my home. There are, can be a point where you throw everything you can into a job and it's when it's too late you realize the job doesn't care about you it will always be about the bottom line it will always be about middle management it will always be about the numbers and it will always be about us just being resources not even human resources and i was like well i don't even know how to sign off on this she was like well how about and we thought we both paused for a moment and she thought until next time. And I was like, you know what? Sure. I don't know. Maybe life will cross our paths again someday. I have no idea. Somewhere I have the emails and stuff and a lot of the uh, stuff that we talked about. So I know I have her name in my notes. And if I'm ever in Canada and I happen to be around the area that she lives in, maybe I can swing by there and be like, hey, is there an older lady that lives around here? That's by this name. I want to say she lives somewhere near Moose Jaw or something like that. But I don't think that's right. I don't even think that's remotely right. I don't know why that's coming back to my head. So fast forward back to, you know, me getting let go. That whole scenario kept playing through my head. And they had this crazy moment where you go and you get, um, get, you get your box and you're packing shit up. Now, here's the weird thing. Um, I, I don't have any photos available right now. Otherwise, I'd be throwing them in this video. But I used to take photos of my areas. So we kept moving desks. So it just became something where I was like, someday I'm going to make a whole poster of like everywhere I've moved at Hallmark. And I had a lot of shit. Because one of the things that's really weird is Hallmark had a, had a pattern with people where if you worked there, they didn't want to see an empty cubicle. I never really saw the point of bringing stuff to work. I just didn't. Because inevitably, I was like, well, if I lose my job, there's going to be more clutter and bullshit in my home. And I don't want that. 
And at one point in time, like in creative, they used to be able to make turn their cubicles into castles and all this other shit, but then people complain. People are bitches. So finally I get pressured and I start bringing stuff in. So I had books and little ornaments and things I'd get or 3D things I was printing from Leap Lab. But for the couple months leading up to it, kept having this weird feeling. I did not trust the fact that we were training all these people in India and they were getting work done and we were just kind of sitting around waiting and processing and checking the work. It was very weird. So I slowly started taking stuff home. And uh, the only thing I didn't end up taking home was those walls I talked about customizing along the whole thing. And um, ended up getting all that stuff for the most part out to where it just looked like there was enough there. Enough to get into one Hallmark larger box for shipping. And because uh, those are the boxes they would hand us. After that was done, um, we were supposed to go to meet with a job placement personnel. And it was this very chipper woman, probably about five foot something. And I remember she was very jubilant and very happy. And I was like, this woman has nothing to do with me getting fired. And, you know, I, but she, I think she was kind of bracing for that and was like trying to be the antithesis of what most people were feeling. When I went in there, I was like, nah, it's not a big deal. I'm good. Because she was like, hey, how's it going? I'm like, I'm doing great. And then she was like, well, now. And she was like, well, so we're offering, you know, positions, you know, our placement position help. So, like, if you're needing help finding a job, I mean, we've got some options and everything. I was like, you know what? Um, I think I'm going to wing it. And I did, honestly. I totally turned that down because most of it was just trying to, it was just helping, it was like supposed to be like some help that Hallmark had played with to kind of get your, your resume slash curriculum vitae going, maybe setting up a website, looking at a different aspects. This was all shit I had done. And I'd read what they wanted, you know, out of it in the email. I'm like, this is not going to help me and I'm just going to waste this woman's time. And it was... The whole day was a blur. I think it took me about three hours to get the fuck out of work. I went around and I said my goodbyes to a few people. And I got a cart and I wheeled my shit out past the... <laughs> what was so crazy was that you have security guards at every major entry point. Because they used to have a problem where people would wheel a fucking Mac out. And go, oh, yeah, I'm taking the elevator up to floor eight. And they just walk the fuck out to the garage and take the shit home. So I think they had to get more savvy about it. But I just packed up my stuff. And I remember they, they looked at my things, but I specifically didn't take a lot of shit. Uh, I, I didn't leave a lot of shit. I, I took it all earlier because I was like, I'm not fucking taking out stuff looking like I need two men in a truck to get the fuck out of here. So I got all that stuff taken care of. And see, this video is now running long as shit. And I had already, you know, had the meeting and that went well and everything. And I passed my buddy who had been sitting next to me in the meeting, and he was incensed. He was furious. And uh, he's like, I'm never fucking working here again. These motherfuckers can fucking... He just went off. We were in the hallway, and I'm like, whoa. And now, understand that he had had a brother who had worked there years previously. And I'm not dropping any names on this, because I'm not going to hold anyone to this. And But he had had family that had been let go. And it was a really messy debacle. And this was, this had to hurt, right? This had to be some serious bullshit. And it was, it was. Um, thankfully, he ended up coming back on, I think he's back on full-time. It's three years later, he's back on full-time. I never got that option. I came back on as a as, uh, contract and then contract part-time, which is really weird. But so when that happened, I remember I got out into my vehicle and I don't remember where I went to go eat now. I, I may have just been downtown at Wendy's. I don't really know. And I, I remember thinking to myself, like, well, that was a fucking weird thing. And someday I'll go into the whole history of what happened and how many times I was in and out of Hallmark. But moving to back to today, my heart goes out to every one of that company who is hoping they're not going to get fired. My heart goes out to every single person that had to take mandatory, voluntary, you know, leave of their work. And I just feel bad for anyone that was that was in this circumstance because I don't have a problem with people working at Hallmark. I have a problem with the way that Hallmark treats people. And I have talked to former Hallmarkers of all kinds, depending on who you were, 
depended on what was going on. There, like any company, there's always been favorites. There's always been political bullshit. And there's always been weird things involved in there. But essentially at the heart of it, it's a company that loves to say it's all about feelings and emotions and make in when you care to send the very best. But this was a circumstance where it felt like when it that they were a company that took pride in sending away the very best they had, which was their employees, many who had given decades of their lives to work there. So that's a reality of working in corporate America. And I'm certain some of you probably can understand, if not have lived through something similar. That's enough for now. <laughs> Holy shit, that got deep and long. That's weird and weird and weird. You all have a good evening, and I will catch you in my next journal entry. Thanks again for watching. I appreciate it very much.